I wish you knew how happy I am to be here. As I look through the audience, I see some old friends, some of them complete with their gray hair, some have become bold and what have you. It is nice to be at this camp. I've heard a lot about this camp. I said, well, I was still in Namibia. We kept hearing about this campsite and I, I'm so glad that finally I've managed to be here. I just want to make one or two announcements. Elder Mark Taro was speaking about uh, setting up a gong or gong. I'm not too sure which one of the two. <laughs> but please do let me know when I have uh, exceeded my time limit. I do not have any time on me here. I love to keep to time. And uh, secondly, please kindly bear with me. I, I, I woke up around 2 a.m. I was anxious about coming here and I couldn't sleep well thereafter. So I'm a bit dozy this morning. If I sleep, just wake me up. Will you do that? <laughs> I'm saying all these things because I'm tensed up. I just want us to laugh and then just wheeze me as well. <laughs> well, Friends, it's an honor. Believe me, it's an honor for me to be here. Amen. Uh, Kyle Count is really a privilege to stand before God's people and just share one or two things. As I'll tell you, it will be Madala style. You know, in Madala, the story is a story is a story. So if you sleep, you miss out on stories. I'm looking for my glasses now. Don't worry, I'm looking for them. I'll find them somewhere in the pocket. Uh, there they are. If you turn to the book of Luke chapter 13 and you read together with me from verse 6 to 9, you will find our departure point for the delivery of this sermon. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 6 to 9. The Bible says, And he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why covereth it? the ground. And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, until I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Let us pray together. Blessed Father, Lord God, almighty Savior and friend of sinners. What a joy that your children can come to this site and put aside all their labors and all the other things that require their attention just to tarry at the feet of the Lord. How I pray, how I plead, eternal Father, that I'll stay here for the next six days may not be in vain. May it be so impactful in our spiritual life that when it shall have come to the end, we'll be able to look back and say, Oh, the Lord was with us. Amen. You did promise, Heavenly Father. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, you said that you will be filled with power after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and after the uttermost parts of the world. I plead, Heavenly Father, may it please you this morning to fill us all with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I decided to title our short discussion this morning, This Year Also. This year also. And as I looked at this passage in the course of the 
preceding times to this, it dawned upon me that we are serving a God of the second chance. Just last night, I stood in front of one dear lady, both of us with watery eyes, as she poured out uh, how she struggled for years with one terrible habit. And, and, and as I told her, as I reminded her of this God of the second chance, have you ever seen the beauty of somebody with tears flowing down and yet they are smiling? Why? Because somehow they found something they can hang on to. And as we read this parable, lady and brother, brother and sister, I want you to know that this year also God has given you and me a second chance. But let's not waste much time looking at the second chance issues here. Maybe let's look at this particular tree. I uh, made up a few thoughts, put up a few thoughts together about this particular tree. I want to believe first and foremost that this tree was in a privileged position. Yeah. It didn't own the vineyard. It was planted there. It was privileged to be in this vineyard among all these other tree, trees cared for by the master, cared for by the, 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 the gardener, looked after day in and day out, privileged condition, and yet no fruit. Come to think about it, lady and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, has it ever dawned upon you that we are a privileged generation? I want to believe with all my heart that if this generation is privileged, we in the SDHS are actually more privileged than others. Why? We've got the Holy Bible with us, and the Lord saw it fit to give us the light that he didn't give all the others. He gave us the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And if anything, my brothers and sisters, God expects us to be much more abundantly fruitful than all the other ones that surround us. And yet, lo and behold, many a time, we are much less than them. A friend of mine told me a story that saved him years ago. He was pastor here in Osaka here to go for some meetings in, uh, in Kitwe. His dear wife prepared him, you know, chicken. You know how these uh, lovely wives prepare these takeaways? Nicely baked chicken, baby chicken in those days, in the 70s. They used to, they used to have baby chickens those days. Nowadays I see the quails. I think those are good as, as well. But anyway, she prepared this baby chicken for him. Put it in the oven, and as he left in the luxury coach of those days, he sat next to a guy who he didn't talk much to. And uh, some Puerto Wascapiri, the pastor, started to eat his chicken all alone. <laughs> and when they got to Kapiri portion, this kind gentleman, who didn't have a share of that chicken, got out of the bus, walked into this takeaway, bought two hamburgers and two takeaway fantas, and brought them into the bus. One set for the pastor, one for himself. <laughs> this pastor said, Pastor, I, I wish there was a place where I could just sink. I was embarrassed. Sometimes the world out there friends, tends to be far much more fruitful than we who are privileged people. This tree was in a privileged condition, position, but it failed to deliver. One or two other thoughts on the same tree. This tree, friends of mine, was exposed to the mercies of the owner of the garden. This guy had been coming for the previous three years. Year after year, he goes back empty-handed. <coughs> and now when he comes to this tree, he finds in the third year there's nothing productive. He says, cut it down. And 
then the gardener says, give it a chance. But the sweet thing about it is that the owner of the garden was such a kind man. He says, okay, fine, we'll give it one more year. Little did that tree, ladies and gentlemen, little did that tree know that that particular year was its decisive, defining year. And sometimes when I look around, you know, I've been away, some of you know I've been away for some time, and I've come back home now. Sometimes I dread to ask, hey, how is so and so? Because you never know, maybe he's long resting in the grave. And then you look at the statistics of our country. They are telling us that for us men, please do correct me, those of you who are in the know, they say the average lifespan for a man in Zambia is 47. So people like me who are 59, we are living on what I want to call Mbasera years. And you never know in these Mbasera years, any particular year can be your defining year. It can be your decisive year. What you do in that year determines where you will spend eternity. And oh, beloved saints, as we sit here, as we've come to sit at the feet of these men of God who will come and speak to us, let it be that we will sink deep our roots in the rock Christ, Christ Jesus, via his holy word. I must labor over one other point here. Ben Maxon, in his book, The Missing Collection, I had the privilege of meeting this dear man. I must admit he really blessed me with a few things we shared, but the book he wrote, The Missing Collection, has been one huge blessing to my life. In that book, he quotes Robert Herring, and he says, our life is to be like a river, not a reservoir. We should not hold back what God has given us, but we should pass it on to others. In other words, let me just paraphrase that. To me, what I hear Ben Maxon saying here, rather Robert Herring is saying here, God has given to us his word. That word must not be kept in our hands like a reservoir. I used to preach years ago at Central Church. I used to say some people have a Bible that always looks brand new. And when you look at the Bible, it's, oh, this dear brother or this dear sister knows how to care for their Bible. And yet the reason why that Bible looks brand new all the time is because it's never read. God has not given you and me the word to gather dust in our homes, to just lie around as a the decoration perhaps in the cars or whatever it may be. God wants us to delve into this word in such a way that we shall be able to pass it on by our very lives. Wasn't it Mahatma Gandhi? Who, I suppose one time I asked, what do you think about Christianity? He said, well, it would be nice to see someone practicing Christianity. Reason being, he hadn't seen it. He had heard about it. He hadn't seen it. And the reason perhaps why he hadn't seen it is because nobody had seriously read the manual about Christianity, the Holy Bible, and gone out to put it into practice. And I'm so glad our leaders have said this year we'll take the theme, God's word, our word. I want to add God's word, our word, our very life. This tree, assuming this tree was a human being, now this thing, consider it to be a human being. I want to believe that this tree may have been suffering from a disease, for lack of a better word, I'll just make up my own disease, my own termination for, determination? My, my own terms for it, rather. The, the, the arrival disease, the, I have arrived disease. Uh, this tree must have come to a point where it looked around and said, well, I have made it. I'm here in the garden. 
What more do I need to do? They tell us these leadership gurus that one of the most tragic things you can ever do in life is to stop growing. And I think John Maxwell alludes to that idea in, 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 in his book where he, he talks about a certain tribe in, in, in Central Asia who have a, a way of cursing their enemies and they say to them, may you stay in one place forever. <laughs> Meaning you must not grow. If you are a poor man, you better stay poor forever. If you have this disease, may it never be healed. Ladies and gentlemen, brother and sister, somehow uh, some of us have stayed stuck on one level for years. And the tragedy of it is that we are contented with it. No bother. Also. You ask the brother today, give me your favorite verse, John 3, verse 16, he'll, get, he'll give it to you from A to Z. Ask him 10 years later, it's still the same verse. Ask him to give you any other verses, he can't remember any other verses. No, ladies and gentlemen, time to grow. The times we live have changed. Never has history been like this. And remember there was a time when men and women must be deep into God's word and grow it is now. Amen. Allow me to also say that this tree was in the garden where all the other trees, that's my assumption, were productive. But this tree was non-productive and that did not bother me. It's a sad thing to be able to be in the midst of everybody else. They are making progress, they are doing things, things are happening in their lives. They are making strides of success here and there, and you are totally indifferent to your failure to match up with their efforts. So I am just not with us. But allow me to also say, this tree gave a very false hope to the honor of the garden. I want to believe this guy came with a, gar with a, with, with a basket, and maybe he was not there like me, he, he, carried, he walked with his grandson. They were anxious to go to this tree and come back home, maybe for breakfast, with some fruit from this particular tree. And I want to believe from a distance, as they looked at it, it looked like it had fruits. But lo and behold, as they got close to it, there was nothing. I forget that writer who said one of the tragic mistakes of the Christian world today is that so many of us look like Christians. And yet on the other hand, we have massively accommodated the world in our Christian life. Many of us look like Christians. Many of us even dress like Christians. Many of us even talk like Christians. Many of us even have jobs in the Christian church. And yet, when God brings his microscope and begins to look for fruit, uh -uh, there's nothing. And to a great extent, it's because the word of God has had no effect in our life. Elders, Mother, feel free to let me know when my time is up. Let me put a few more points here before that time. This tree, the owner of the garden comes in and he's fed up with it. He wants to cut it down. He wants to just end the life of this tree. I, I want to believe the tree is standing here. The owner of the vineyard is standing here. The gardener is standing here. I don't know, maybe there was an axe. These two, the owner of the garden and the, the, the gardener are talking about this tree and this tree doesn't know it is being talked about. You and I are here on earth singing songs of Zion, attending camp meetings, doing all kinds of things within the Christian faith. Little did we, do we know when our name comes for mention in the 
judgment in heaven. Did you ever stop to think about that? Oh, that God would help us to live with an immediate sense of understanding that any day my name could come up for mention. What will it be like when it comes up for mention? What would it be like if it was done so even now? One thing we must remember, friends, trees can be cut and another one planted. You and I, God can do without us. It is only by his grace that we are still alive. I have a mother. She is in her 80s now. She is having health challenges and every now and then as children we are concerned. Two weeks ago, she has to be taken down to Southern Province, so I gave my sister my van to take her to go and see family members. And when they came back, Mama and my young sister, Vista, you know, we sat together and we were chatting finally. Mama started to pray for us. And I was impressed with her prayer. I talked to my young sister about the prayers of Mama. And she says, oh, you should have heard her praying last week. I said, uh -huh. what did she say? She said, she said, in the morning when we were having devotion, as we knelt down to pray, Mama said, oh God, oh, thank you for the grace of another day. Another day. Ladies and gentlemen, brother and sister, do you realize, do I realize that every single day, including this year also, is by God's grace. Oh, that we would use it to apply ourselves seriously to the things that matter in our spiritual lives. I must also perhaps wrap up by saying one or two things here. One of the writers that has really meant quite a bit to me says this thing about life. It is, his name is Greenwell Kent Clayslaw. He writes on leadership. He says, your life is like a book. The title page is your name. The preface is your introduction to the world. The pages are a daily record of your efforts, your trials, your pleasures, your discouragements, and your achievements. Day by day, your thoughts are being inscribed in that book of life. Hour by hour, the record is being made that must stand for eternity. When the last page is written, let it be said of your book of life, it is a book of noble purpose, generous service, and work well done. May I suggest to you very strongly that in order for this to be the case, when the pages of your life, when the pages of my life are closed, take this book. Take it seriously. It will make a difference. You need it. Amen. Amen.